Madam Chair, Ranking Member Schmidt, thank you both for the terrific job you're doing with this very important subcommittee, and welcome to each of the witnesses. Uh, since I was first elected to the Senate 11 years ago, I have been proud uh, to help lead nearly every major piece of space legislation that's been signed into law. Just last year, as part of my NASA Authorization Act, which I led alongside Senator Sinema, Senator Wicker, and Senator Cantwell, uh, that legislation was included in the Chips and Sciences Act, securing, among other things, an extension of the International Space Station to 2030. I'm especially proud that Texas is at the forefront of American leadership in space. From NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, home to our astronaut corps and mission control, to the myriad of commercial space companies across the state, including SpaceX and Blue Origin, who are both here today, the road to the final frontier runs through Texas. But we can't rest on our laurels. As the pace of commercial space activity has picked up, our regulatory system has started to strain and is now showing serious cracks. Some of our witnesses have hit on this point today, but it's worth noting that if the system breaks and the commercial space industry grinds to a halt, the risk is far more substantial than a few billionaires losing their ability to take joyrides in space. The government relies on a vibrant domestic commercial space sector for access to space, whether that is transporting our astronauts to the ISS, sending rovers to Mars, launching national security missions, or any of the other myriad space missions. On most policy issues, my philosophy is quite clear. Get government out of the way to the greatest extent possible and let the private sector roar. I believe the commercial space sector holds tremendous potential, and I've long said that I think the first trillionaire will be made in space. Previously, a domain exclusively of governments, upstart commercial companies have helped democratize space in a way that very few thought possible even a decade ago. Along the way, they have helped drive down the price point of launch, which has helped save the taxpayer money, and has led to a proliferation of new technologies and plans for in-space activities. But to accommodate this growth and to enable the future potential, the regulatory framework must be clearly defined, allow for innovation, and be accountable for the actions it does or does not take. As we think about regulation in commercial space, top of mind for many is the expiration of the learning period. This is understandable and an issue we need to, and I believe will address, but we need to answer the broader and more definitional questions about what the future of regulation looks like, not just for the next two years, but for the next 20. The prior administration did good work to try to update and modernize launch and reentry regulations, but there's a lot of work still to be done. Similarly, we need to address the still burdensome remote sensing regulations, and we need to cut red tape around all the various types of permitting that permeate commercial space. This hearing today is an opportunity to learn from those in industry, in the academy, and from a former policymaker about the state of commercial space and to reflect on how the current regulatory scheme is or is not working. In my opinion, too many agencies are involved. It slows technological and scientific advancements, and it puts us at, at a disadvantage compared to our international competitors and rivals. It is long past time that we create a true one-stop shop for the regulation and licensing of commercial space activities and make the United States the destination of choice for commercial space companies looking to set up shop. That all starts with regulatory certainty, transparency, and accountability. Finally, I mentioned the ISS. It is imperative that the United States maintain a human presence in low Earth orbit. With ISS's mission extended until 2030, it is important to talk about what is next. Not only is LEO the tip of the spear on commercialization of space, but more fundamentally, it is a strategic domain where we cannot afford to cede our leadership, especially to communist China. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and to continuing to work 
with Chairwoman Cantwell, Subcommittee Chairwoman Sinema, Ranking Member Schmidt, as we together craft a bipartisan, bold, and forward-looking commercial space bill. Thank you. Senator Cruz, you're recognized for your questions if you'd like to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gerstenmeier, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your many years of service with NASA. I think I can speak for many members of this committee when I say that we were all watching with excitement as Starship made its first test flight at Boca Chica earlier this year. And we look forward to you all proceeding with your next launch and more as you get ready to help put American boots back on the lunar surface. I also greatly appreciated the, the opportunity recently to visit Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas over the August recess to see firsthand the incredible work that SpaceX is doing in South Texas. And I don't want to exclude Mr. Joyce here. Van Horn is on my list, and I'm planning to get out and see the great work Blue is doing in West Texas as well. Look, the commercial space industry is at an inflection point. Industry, with some government support, but also leveraging immense amounts of private capital, has brought new novel technologies into production that hold the potential to do everything from closing the digital divide in broadband internet to making the human race truly multiplanetary. They are ready to, for, to take off if only we will let them. Now, Mr. Gerstemeyer, you have extensive experience with space vehicle development and space operations. I want to ask you what may seem like a simplistic question, but it gets at something you raised in your testimony. In your experience, and obvious, obviously there are caveats, are flight-proven vehicles and hardware more or less reliable than vehicles and hardware that aren't flight-proven? I think there's a tremendous advantage of a flight-proven vehicle. You see that in the reusability of the Falcon program. You know, we've, we've flown 74 flights this year. We learn from every one of those flights, and that learning, if we're open and transparent and we see where problems are, we can fix those small problems before they become big problems. So sometimes it's seen as we're rushing to flight, but we're actually, by flight testing, we're effectively flight testing the vehicle every time we fly, and we're learning and we're developing. We're doing the same thing with Starship. Starship's test flight may, to some, have looked like a failure. It was not a failure. It was a huge learning experience for us. We gained more data from that flight, more knowledge that helps us advance than we could have through a thousand years of analysis and mathematical studies and tests. Going to flight, still protecting the public, keeping the environment safe, allows us to move at the fastest pace we can. So I'm a strong supporter of active flight test. Well, thank you. I, I very much agree, and, and I think that is objectively correct. But to pull on this thread, articles in the Washington Post and Ars Technica yesterday discussed how SpaceX has been ready for its second Starship launch for weeks, but is now apparently waiting on the Fish and Wildlife Service, who, just to be crystal clear, they don't launch rockets. But Fish and Wildlife needs to finish its consultation next month. I can't help but be concerned that bureaucratic red tape at AST and Fish and Wildlife and from other agencies have injected themselves into the launch licensing process. All of these agencies have already conducted and approved an environmental review for the first launch of Starship. But since SpaceX is going to keep trying, now the federal government wants to do another entirely duplicative environmental review. Do you think other agencies' involvement is speeding up or slowing down Space SpaceX's ability to test, launch, and iterate vehicle development? As we're, it's, it's a shame when our hardware is ready to fly and we're not able to go fly because of regulations or re-review. The fact that we can get the launch pad repaired and get it ready to go fly, support a flight. The fact that I can get a vehicle manufactured and ready to go fly. We have three or four other vehicles also ready to go fly. The pace of our test flight should not be governed by the regulation. We need to be safe. We need to protect the environment. We don't dismiss those, but we need to fly at the fastest pace that we can do hardware development to do this, this active development process and this test flight experience that we've described. Well, again, I agree with that. 
at AST's current speed, what's the earliest HLS will be ready? It, it's hard to say. I, we've got it, you know, the, we need to fly at the fastest pace. To be fair, we also have huge technical challenges, right? This is a large spacecraft we're building. You got to see it when you went down to Boca. It's an amazing vehicle. But 33 engines, the staging, all this is new technology. We need to test that soon, learn what's wrong, fix it, and go fly again. And we cannot be held up by regulation. So it's hard for me to give a specific date of where we are, but the current pace where regulation is driving, that should not be the case. The burden should be put on us as a private company, put on SpaceX, and let us develop at the fastest pace. We should be the ones that are driving the development, not being driven by regulatory oversight. Well, and having seen firsthand what you're doing in South Texas, it is extraordinary and very, very impressive. My final question, if you were still at NASA, would this delay be acceptable? Would schedule delays like this be something that makes a NASA program successful? Simply would not be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you.